Carolina This Week with Tim McGinnis. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Filing is over and the candidates are set for the 7th Congressional District, both the Democrats and the Republicans. This morning, we're going to hear from one of those Republicans who's running for the 7th Congressional District. And a little later, we're going to talk about Honor Flight, a fantastic way to honor our World War II veterans. First up, Jim Mader, a Republican, running for the 7th Congressional District. Jim Mader, a Republican candidate for the 7th Congressional District, thanks for being with us this morning. Well, thanks, Tim. I appreciate it very much. We've had just about every other candidate on now. You're one of the last ones to come on this show. And what I want to do is just find out who you are and why you're running. So mm -hmm. that's your first question. Sounds who are good. you? Why are you running? Well, my name is Jim Mader, running for Congress, just like just about everybody else in the district. Uh, basically, right now, I'm a landscaper. Before, I was in retail management, worked for Kmart, Target, uh, Pier 1, uh, managed up to 200 people at a time, trying to you know keep things for the customers. And that's what I'm doing now. Um, I see the need in the district. I see the need in Washington. And that's why I'm running, because of the fact that I used to sit on the sofa and complain at the TV set, you know, these idiots or morons or what's going on in the country. And now I'm tired of sitting on the sofa and complaining. So I'm throwing my hat into the ring and hopefully bring some sanity to Washington. I want to talk to you first about some of the issues that affect us here in the Grand Strand and okay. PD, and then we'll move on to some national issues a little bit later on. All right. First question for you, I-73 is one of the dominant local issues that right. we hear about. Do you think we need I-73 coming to Myrtle Beach, or do you think it's something that we don't need to be focusing on right now? I think we need I-73 and more than just I-73. I-73 drops into uh, 22. Okay, then you can go to North Myrtle Beach, or you can get stuck on 501. We need a solution to 501. We need a solution to 31. 31 is great if you're for getting around Myrtle Beach, but we need 31 to connect down into Georgetown off 701. 701 needs to be four-laned. Up in Florence, we need to take 76 and go through Marion County with it and connect all the way into I-74 because Florence, to me, is the center of our industrial complex for this district. And we've, it's situated between two ports, the port in Charleston, it's got close to the port in Georgetown, and it's the port in Wilmington. We can put ourselves in the center of everything and be the greatest economic boost the state has ever seen. How would you, from Washington, work to get that done? Because a lot of people say, well, I, they, won't, they won't do earmarks. Right. And a lot of people say they, you know, that they don't know that this is the time to be going to get money for a project right. like this. How about you? Um, earmarks are good if you know about the earmark. Throwing it in on a piece of legislation at the very last minute because it's a must-pass piece of legis legislation, I don't agree with. But putting it in there beforehand to as really designate the, the money for that, I think is fair and natural way to do in business. Sometimes you can't wait for the federal government. We've been waiting on the federal government for 20 years for I-73. They've been waiting almost 10, 15 years to dredge the port in Georgetown. Sometimes you have to act alone, and you've got to, to invest in yourselves, and that's what sometimes you have to do. You have to have belief in yourself and belief in those projects and start before the government gets involved. Some other issues on the federal level that are affecting us here on the Grand Strand. People say that uh, that we don't need that, that the ADA requirement that pool lifts be in in any public pool right. is unfair to a lot of business owners who can't afford it. Do you think that the rules should be relaxed? Do you think that this is an example of government overstepping their bounds? How how do you see that? I believe it's government overstepping their bounds. I understand the need for the pool lifts. If you're handicapped or non-physically able to get into a pool, it would be nice to have that for the guest, but to require it for every single pool that for someone, it's, it's just astronomically expensive. We've got to think of correct reg, uh, regulation, smart regulation, work with those businesses to be able to make them handicap accessible. How about the other regulation that says that hotels have to have, cannot have glass enclosures over their swimming pools, which hurts a lot of our hotels during the winter months because yes. that's the way we keep residents swimming in, re <laughs> in recreational pools. Well, I like to take a dip in the wintertime too, but I don't want to have to go out into the ocean and freeze myself to death. But, you know, 
if you take them down during hurricane season, I think that's fine. If you put them up after hurricane season, I think that's also fine. You just have to have some intelligence about what kind of regulations that you have. Now I want to talk about the thing that I think is on most people's minds when it comes down to what they want out of a representative in Washington, and that's somebody who can make businesses come to our area to create jobs. I don't have to tell you, mm -hmm. this area has been hit particularly hard by the recession. Yes. Parts of the parts of our viewing area, parts of the seventh district, have some of the highest unemployment rates, not in the state, in the country. Right. How would you bring jobs? Well. The least expensive way to bring jobs in this area is to reduce the regulation and the tax burden that we put on industries. You know, relaxing a law or removing a law or removing a restriction doesn't cost anything. Let's take a look at our, our regulations, and in fact in Congress I would push that all regulations and laws have to have a five-year cycle to, for review and have a cost-benefit analysis on them to find out, you know, is it good to have that restriction or is it bad for business to have that restriction? And let's get this country back to work. We don't need any more minimum wage jobs. We need jobs that people can go out, take care of themselves and their families, and not have to work two or three jobs or five jobs for household to take care of themselves. We need to make ourselves attractive to business, not just having people available, having a high unemployment rate, but having a higher educational rate, having people that are striving to better themselves. That's what we need to bring to this area to get the industry in here. What are some of the restrictions that you think are in place that might be keeping companies from hiring in our area or locating in our area? One would be the, the tax on manufacturers that the state has. I know they're reviewing that now. Uh, hopefully they'll speed that up and get that taken down. Uh, the other one is, I call it mandated health care. So hopefully the Supreme Court will strike that down. I think it should be a cooperative agreement between the worker and the company to decide what kind of benefits should be offered to each person. And the, the higher the cost of the employee, the fewer people you can hire unless you have an extremely profitable business. That's what business operates on is how much money they can make and if it's worth their time and effort. What is the singular thing that you think you could bring to the table for the Grand Strand and PD as our representative in Washington? Okay. The biggest part of this job is not what you can do in Washington for the big votes that we, everybody thinks about. It's the person that needs help with Washington. That's my job and my focus during my entire career in retail and in landscaping is to please the customer. Every voter, every constituent out there, I work for them. And it's my job to make sure that they're taken care of. If they have a problem or if they have a concern, doesn't matter if they voted for me or voted against me or didn't vote at all. My job is to take care of their need and help them to the best of my ability. All right. I want to talk about some of the broader national issues, even though we touched on health care. We may bring that up okay. again after a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Carolina This Week. Jim Mader, a Republican running for the 7th Congressional District seat, is my guest this morning. We talked a little bit about health care in the last block. I want uh -huh. to talk it, about it a little bit more. What do you make of the health care mandate? Is, does the whole law need to be struck down, or does just the mandate that people need to buy their own need to be well, struck out? They've already talked about it. You know, They didn't have the, the part of the law in there that says, you know, if this part is taken out, the rest of it stands. So as I'm looking at it, as soon as they take care of the mandate, the whole law falls apart. And that's what the next session of Congress is going to have to look at repairing, is we have to decide what kind of health care system we want. I don't want health care. I want inexpensive. When I go to the doctor, I want it to be inexpensive. I don't want my health insurance to be inexpensive. I want my health care to be inexpensive. And that's what we need to look at. How can we improve the competitiveness of the health industry, not just the health insurance industry, but actually doctor to doctor, hospital to hospital. So bringing what, costs down. Bringing costs down. That's what the most hardest part of medical care is, is the expense on it. Let's put some competition into it. Let's let hospitals, doctors, insurance companies compete across state lines before we get government involvement in it. Let's see what happens on a free market basis it's going to be difficult at first, but we have to take care of these people that can't afford a doctor. I mean, they're limited income based on gasoline and food. 
they can't afford to pay for their medical care. We need to get the system so that the medical care, not just the insurance, but medical care itself is controlled. I had an economist from CCU as my guest a few weeks ago. We were talking about gas prices, uh -huh. which are escalating, as I yes, don't have to tell are. you, rather quickly. He told me that this really shouldn't be a surprise. We were going this way. The recession hit. Prices dropped. Things are improving. Gas prices are going back up. They're probably not going to return to where they were back at the $3 level even mm -hmm. in the near future right. or possibly ever. What should our approach toward energy be? Our approach to energy is full bore everything. Take nothing off the table, go for everything. Whether it's nuclear, um, hydrogen, natural gas, oil, coal, everything we, we need to do. Our economy thrives on inexpensive energy. Every time you raise the price of energy, no matter what it is, it slows the economy down and causes it a burden. We need cheap energy. We, based on our supplies that we have, it depends on who you talk to. It's only good for 45 years, 200 years. You know, we need to take what we've got and use it to the fullest capacity this country can so we can get our economy going to take care of our citizens. That's who, what's important is the citizens of this country. A lot of talk about wind energy off the coast of South Carolina. Yes. Government incentives for that type of thing or? I, I don't like tax breaks. Okay, if we're gonna do something, let's do it on cash basis and let's track it so we can see where the money goes and who gets the money. A lot of these tax breaks, you can't see who's getting it. There's this tied up in the IRS or somebody else's office. But if you post it online, we've gave 200 million to this company, this is what it's for, post it online, at least we know what's happening with the money, at least we can follow it. Foreign policy, we've, we've had a <laughs> heck of a last decade or so. Yes, we have. We're out of Iraq now for all intents and purposes. There's still several thousand yeah. contractors and other, and other yeah, personnel over there. Good term for it, yeah. yes. And in Afghanistan, we're still, we're still there and we're facing increasing challenges there, it seems, every day. What do you think our policy should be as far as Afghanistan, first off? Afghanistan, when we went in there, we should have decided what we're going to do in there. Our policy right now seems to be let's hold it till after the election and then just run as fast as we can. I believe, and I always taught by my father, is if you're going to get into a fight, fight to win. Don't just fight to hold things steady. That's what you get into a fight. I mean, we're risking people's lives. We're ruining people's lives by not having a firm policy. And then tell your enemy, we're going to leave in two years, do what you want, you know, we'll negotiate with you, but we're leaving in two years no matter what happens. That's just the wrong way to run a war. What about these countries we see like Syria having uprisings? I mean, we're reticent to get involved, probably for some very good reasons, because we don't know exactly who would be backing if we did get in there. <laughs> right. But do you think we should find some way to support the forces that are trying to overcome the regime there? Well, it depends. If the forces are fighting for freedom, as how we understand freedom, where you have the freedom to vote, the freedom to protest, the freedom to read any newspaper that you want to, that's what we should fight for. If we're just fighting it so somebody else can put their style of rule in place and to control their population, no. I think a lot of countries need to take the effect that, we, like we did back in our Revolutionary War, is you fight for what you believe in. And I think that's what the Syrian people should do. Not just a small part of their population, but if they want freedom, then you fight for it. If you just want a different aspect of control, it's not worth it. Last question for you. <laughs> okay. I throw this to everybody. Why should I vote for you? Because I'm not your average politician. I've never been in politics before. Uh, like I said before at the beginning, I'm just tired of what's going on in Washington. Uh, you can check me out on the internet, you can do your investigations on me, whatever you want to. I'm in it because I love this country and I'm concerned on the direction it's going in. And I will work hard for the people of this district, I will work hard for the people of this county and this city. Uh, I've been in South Carolina since 1980, boy that was a long time ago. And you got to do the best you can. You can't just keep voting for the same people that come up and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm for you, I'm for the little guy, 
but then they're bringing in three, four, five, six hundred thousand, a million, two million dollars to run their campaign. That's not what America's about. America's about freedom, about choice. And we keep choosing the wrong people, we keep choosing the people with money, and we need to put the regular person up in Congress, the people that understand what it's like to try to buy a loaf of bread or a box of cereal that used to be a dollar ninety-nine that's now four ninety-nine or a 12-pack of Coke that used to be $1.99 is now $4.99. We're hurting on the streets. And people that make a lot of money, God bless them, I appreciate what they've done, they've worked hard in their lives, but they don't realize how hard it is for the average American family to survive. And that's what I bring to Congress, is that I understand it because I live it every single day. All right, Jim Mater, Republican, running for the 7th Congressional District seat. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Tim.